The Middle East remains on edge after the U.S. killing of Iranian general Qasem Soleimani. Massive crowds packed Iran. Capital for the general's funeral. Iran pledged vengeance for the sudden strike on its top military leader. Iran says it will no longer abide by the 2015 nuclear agreement that capped uranium enrichment. For more on the crisis, we're joined by Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Woods, Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Good to be with you. So, Iran has vowed to retaliate. What might that actually look like? Well, we call this a horizontal escalation. You know, it could be something direct, you know, military attacks against U.S. forces in the region, whether it's Iraq or Syria. We also have troops in Qatar and Oman, uh, Bahrain, uh, Kuwait. So these are all potential targets. But you could see things that Iran has done in the, in the, in the uh, past, like attacks against U.S. interests or embassies or U.S. personnel in different countries. You know, it could be, in, I don't know, Brazil or Germany or you know, anywhere else, really. So you can have operatives at work, uh, very low level uh, in terms of identifying uh, uh, characteristics, and they prosecute some kind of a singular attack. So these are the sorts of things that the State Department, Department of Defense, or intelligence community have to be aware of, and they'll act appropriately and send out warnings to U.S. personnel, uh, both government and private citizens traveling abroad. Iraq has now voted to expel U.S. troops from that country. Is this mostly symbolic or will we actually be seeing U.S. troops leaving Iraq? Well, at the moment, it's completely symbolic. This is a non-binding resolution in parliament. Uh, really, only about half were present for the vote. Uh, the Kurds and the Sunni Iraqis uh, with stay, uh, either uh, didn't vote, cast a vote or voted against this particular resolution. But it's something that kind of a sense of the parliament, those that participated in that vote, almost all Shia, uh, it pushes forward. But since they don't have an acting governor or government, uh, it really doesn't have any kind of legal um, uh, impact on the U.S. Uh, presence there in that country. A uh, U.S. government website was hacked by a group that claims to be affiliated with Iran. Uh, we don't know if there's any relation, uh, but is cybersecurity a new battlefront, front, and how concerned should we be? Yeah, well, it's an old battlefront. I mean, uh, you know, since the advent of the web and, and the invention of malware, we're seeing everything from the ransomware attacks on U.S. cities and uh, various companies and all, the defacement of U.S. government websites. Uh, we've seen attacks of various types from North Korea, Iranian operatives in the past, and certainly uh, Russian uh, trolls and uh, different uh, perpetrators of malware attacks. So these are things in the cybersecurity world that companies, private individuals, and government agencies are very aware of. And uh, it just uh, yeah, I guess increases the breadth of things that an opponent can do uh, to try to make their point against the United States. Are we looking at any potentially wider geopolitical conflicts here? Iran earlier conducted naval drills with Russia and China. What might we see this expand here? Well, these are all opportunistic actors. So whether it's coordinated between Tehran and Beijing or Tehran and Moscow or even between Moscow and Beijing, um, it really doesn't, I'm going to say it doesn't matter. Uh, but each of these capitals are looking at what ties up the United States and where the U.S. does get tied up in a particular region in some part of the world, then somebody like a Vladimir Putin or a Kim Jong-un might take advantage of that. So they see benefit to getting the U.S. embroiled in uh, these sorts of uh, matters or issues in one particular region, and then they use that opportunity to make a move in some other part of the world. So again, it's something that the U.S. government has to be very aware of. We're a global country with global interests, and you just need the resources and the personnel that can cover down on all these sorts of issues as they evolve over time. Uh, so President Trump ran on this idea of take, getting the U.S out of these wars in the Middle East, these seemingly endless wars. We're now sending 3,500 troops into the region. Um, is this kind of the opposite of what he wanted? Did this backfire at all? No, I mean, it's, it's not a contradiction. There are inconsistencies. You want to have a, a kind of a grand plan for what you would like to do, but the U.S. only has one vote in this. So you could say that our focus needs to be on the Indo-Pacific and on China as, as a strategic competitor. But if Russia does something in Ukraine or against the Baltic states or something in northern uh, Europe, it's not that you can ignore that. Similarly, in the Middle East, if there are attacks against U.S. personnel 
or against a U.S. partner, like this Iranian attack against oil fields in Saudi Arabia, as an example, or Iranians spurring Hezbollah to conduct strikes against Israel would be another example. You can't ignore that. So you respond to emerging or evolving situations with the resources needed to deal with that. But that doesn't mean that you have lost sight of your strategic objective, which is to reduce U.S. involvement in these sorts of messy, intractable you know, conflicts and, and focus your resources as you can to larger, more important strategic matters. And, and just quickly, what is the end game here? How does the U.S. get out of this and how does Iran get out of this without a full-fledged war? Well, it, uh, hopefully it's going to be Iran that decides that the pain is much more uh, than any benefit that it might gather. It's been trying to extend its influence across the Middle East. There is a conflict within Islam between Shia and Sunni, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and so uh, does the economic uh, penalty, does the uh, physical penalty of uh, maybe absorbing strikes in the United States outweigh its perceived benefit? in a given period of time. So we'll have to see how Iran responds to this and, uh, and then just make decisions as we move forward. All right, Lieutenant Colonel Dakota Wood, a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate My your pleasure. insight.